Hi everyone, welcome to my second extract analysis video for Macbeth. These videos provide in-depth analysis of key extracts from the play to help you prepare for producing detailed explorations of the text for English literature study at GCSE. In today's video, we are looking at the captain's report from Act 1, Scene 2. The scene deals with the aftermath of the battle the witches predicted in Scene 1. Scotland is at war. Macbeth, alongside Banquo, has led King Duncan's army to victory against not only his rebellious kinsman Macdonwald, but also an invasion by King Sueno from Norway. Let's start with a quick summary. An injured captain greets Duncan and reports the defeat of the rebel Macdonwald at the hands of the Thane of Glam's Macbeth, as well as Macbeth and Banquo's defeat of the Norwegian lord, who is supported by the treasonous Thane of Cawdor. Macbeth's courage and bravery turn the tide of the battle. Duncan orders the execution of the treasonous Cawdor and orders the title be passed to Noble Macbeth. Because the scene deals with Macbeth's abilities as a soldier, it is important to reference the context of soldiers and warfare in the medieval period in which Macbeth is set. Remember, this is marked on your GCSE exams as an AO3 skill, which assesses your ability to understand how the play relates to the context in which it was written. Firstly, Shakespeare based the characters of Macbeth, Banquo and Duncan on a historical account of Scotland called Hollinshead's Chronicles, published in 1577. Though the real Macbeth did betray Duncan and become king in the 11th century, many of the play's other events are fictional, with some being borrowed from other historical figures. Secondly, there were specific expectations of soldiers during this time. Wealthy landowners, such as Thanes in Macbeth, were expected to raise an army and defend their king when called upon. Kings were believed to derive their authority from God. Therefore, to serve your king in battle was seen as an act of godly service. Medieval battles involved brutal and bloody fighting, often in close quarters. Soldiers would be revered for their strength and bravery if successful. Before we analyse the scene in closer detail, I'll read through the captain's report so you can get a feel for the language and an initial sense of how Macbeth is presented by Shakespeare. Pay close attention for the introduction of Macbeth following the description of the villain Macdonwald. Does he sound like a hero to you? Doubtful it stood, as two spent swimmers that do cling together and choke their art. The merciless Macdonwald, worthy to be a rebel, for to that the multiplying villainies of nature do swarm upon him, from the western isles of kerns and gallow glasses is supplied and fortune on his damned quarrel smiling showed like a rebel's whore. But all's too weak for brave Macbeth. Well, he deserves that name. Disdaining fortune with his brandished steel, which smoked with bloody execution, like Valor's minion carved out his passage till he faced the slave, which ne'er shook hands nor bade farewell to him till he unseamed him from the knave to the chops, and fixed his head upon our battlements. Hopefully you get a sense from the reading that the captain acknowledges with great enthusiasm Macbeth's strength, courage and skill in battle as the factor which turned the tide in the conflict. You may also have picked up on the brutality and violence of the battle which echoes the medieval context where it is taking place. Now, let's take a look at the extract more closely. Remember, the annotations for this analysis are colour-coded according to their relevant assessment objective. I'll be using yellow to indicate AO3 context, green for AO2 language, and blue for AO2 structure. In terms of structure, Shakespeare chooses to deliver the news of the battle from a captain, rather than through Macbeth himself. This allows the audience to understand how greatly Macbeth is esteemed by both the king and others and provides an honourable contrast to his negative association with the witches we saw in Act 1, Scene 1. First, the captain delivers his report of the battle. He suggests the outcome was in doubt in the simile as two spent swimmers that do cling together and choke their art. This allows the audience to picture an exhausted battlefield with imagery of two drowning swimmers, suggesting the situation was desperate indeed. Furthermore, the description of the merciless Macdonald, on whom fortune showed like a rebel's whore, expresses the depth of villainy of Macbeth's opponent. By using a simile to personify fortune, or luck, as a rebel's prostitute, 
Shakespeare impresses the unreliability and the cruelty of fate itself, which seem to be against them. Structurally, Shakespeare sets up the report to emphasise the odds in numbers, but also seemingly of fate, which were against Duncan's army. This serves to heighten the sense of Macbeth's heroism, as he is introduced to the audience as brave Macbeth, a clear juxtaposition to the merciless Macdonald. Additionally, he is said to disdain fortune with his brandished steel, suggesting that Macbeth is a character who takes fortune into his own hands. Now, Jacobeans believed in fate, and that the people's actions were predetermined or set out by God beforehand. However, Shakespeare seems to be suggesting here that Macbeth can influence fate, since disdaining fortune implies he has no regard or care for the powers which might seek to control him. Fate and free will is established as a key theme in Macbeth here, with Shakespeare introducing the idea that Macbeth will be a character who takes fate into his own hands, which we will see more and more as the play continues. The introduction of Macbeth as a brave warrior links to the conventions of the genre of tragedy. In order to heighten the effect of his downfall, a character in a tragedy should fall from a position of high esteem. You can see that Shakespeare has gone to great lengths to establish Macbeth's character as a heroic warrior here, loved by his men. That way, as the plot unfolds and he begins to make evil and corrupt decisions, the depth of his tragic downfall is increased. In the medieval period in which the play is set, soldiers were expected to serve their king, and by association God himself, by fighting on the battlefield. Victory in battle was seen as a sign of God's favour, and thus Macbeth would be considered by the audience as a hero and a godly man due to his successes in battle on behalf of the king. Descriptions such as Valor's Minion, which translates as Servant of Courage, paint Macbeth as mighty and righteous. While the use of verbs with violent and savage connotations, such as brandished and carved, speak of Macbeth's skill as a warrior, but also foreshadow his ability to kill in a reckless and gruesome way. Additionally, Macbeth does not simply kill Macdonald, he unseamed him from the nave to the chops. Shakespeare uses brutal and gory imagery which suggests Macbeth literally cuts Macdonald in two from the nave, or stomach, to the chops, meaning chin, a description which not only represents Macbeth as a skilled fighter, but also a brutal and bloody one. Later on in the scene, the captain describes the second battle between Duncan's forces and the Norwegian Lord Sueno. This time, symbols are employed to describe Macbeth and Banquo as eagles and lions, both animals which connote strength and majesty, paired with the sparrows and hare of their opponents. A comparison which clearly paints Macbeth and Banquo as predators, again emphasising Macbeth and this time Banquo's skill in battle. The gory resolution is brought to a head when Shakespeare compares the scene of the battle to Golgotha, the site of Christ's crucifixion in the Bible which to Jacobeans would symbolise both a scene of unimaginable horror, but also salvation. This biblical allusion seals Macbeth's dramatic heroism as his seemingly selfless decision to charge into a desperate battle for his king perhaps mirrors the sacrifice of Christ, who is said to have suffered and died on the cross to ensure the salvation of his followers. To the highly religious audience of the Jacobean era, this comparison may not have gone unnoticed. The scene ends with Duncan proclaiming that what the treacherous Thane of Cawdor has lost, noble Macbeth hath won, which completes the picture of Macbeth as a noble and righteous hero in Duncan's eyes, the perfect setup for a tragic fall. I hope you've enjoyed this analysis of Act 1, Scene 2. If you found this short video useful, please support my channel by liking the video and, of course, clicking the link to subscribe for more illustrated literature content.